In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. In the presence of our Lord, I want first to say together, O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. I'd like to speak today for you about Our Lady of Mercy, Mother of Mercy, because the Holy Father has proclaimed a year of mercy that will begin quite soon, in a few months' time. So it's good for us to focus upon this today. She's Mother of Mercy in three different senses. First, in a theological sense. Second, by her life, by her example. And third, by her role of intercession for us. First, theological. She is the mother of mercy because she mothers mercy. She gives birth to Jesus Christ, who is the embodiment, the incarnation of God's mercy. His name will be called Jesus, which means God saves. That's God's mercy. And she's the mother of God saves. She's the mother of Jesus, the mother of mercy. He will save his people from their sins. It's Mary who gives birth to this ocean of mercy. She's the mother of divine mercy. The second sense in which Our Lady is mother of mercy is by example. Right through her life, mercy flowed from her heart. She must have been quite unusual growing up, and I'm sure there was a lot of misunderstanding of her throughout, and even when she was giving birth to Jesus, our Lord. And she had to forgive people. She had to forgive people when they didn't respond to her son, when he was preaching for three years, and many people walked away. She had to forgive particularly at the time of the cross, when people were whipping him and crowning with him with thorns and jeering him, and mocking him and crucifying him. She was the mother of mercy on Calvary. She gives us that example. And when he cries, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, did not she utter the same as his mother, flesh of her flesh, blood of her blood? And after the resurrection, of course, filled with joy, did she not have to forgive those who crucified our Lord again by their sins? Those who failed to respond to his loving message? Who just turned a blind eye? Who were indifferent to what he'd achieved for them? Yes, she's the mother of mercy throughout her life. And third, she's mother of mercy by her role of intercession in heaven. She's mother of mercy because she helps to save sinners today, and particularly with her most powerful tools, the rosary and the brown scapula. I hope you all have both of those. She wins for souls remarkable graces by repentance, just like she won remarkable graces at Cana in Galilee. She, as Mother of Mercy, initiated, began through her intercession at Cana, the public ministry of Christ. It begins, it begins with her intercession as Mother of Mercy. Son, they have no wine. Of course, it was about the marriage feast, but it was also about the entire world. They have no wine. They have no grace. They need mercy. She wins it for us. I'm going to focus on the third one today, her role of intercession as Mother of Mercy. But I first want to say something important about mercy itself, because today there is a lot of nonsense about the meaning of mercy, and it needs to be clarified. When we call Our Lady Mother of Mercy, we have to disassociate her from false 
notions of mercy. Sometimes we have to look at this via negativa, this negative way. It's not always a nice thing to do, but it puts into relief the true way, the positive way. We sometimes have to show the negative to highlight the positive. So here are a few of the instances of what I'm describing as false mercy, which will help us then to understand what Our Lady is about as Mother of Mercy. Have you heard people say, oh, it doesn't matter what people do in their lives, God is merciful? Have you heard people say that? But evidently it does matter. What did our Lord say to the woman caught in adultery? Yes, he can forgive anything. I do not condemn you. But what else did he say? Go and sin no more. This is mercy, forgiveness, and new life. And that's why our Lord had to die for such sins, because they matter. And he tells us, warns us, that there is a wide way, a wide road that leads to destruction. The mercy is that our sins can be forgiven. The mercy is that there is a way, a means now, for us not to sin. There is a way to be good. That is the mercy. Archbishop Fulton Sheen, have you, you've heard of him, great, great preacher, and perhaps soon to be beatified, he used always to say that the worst thing in the world was not sin. He used to say the worst thing in the world was not sin, which can be forgiven by confession. The worst thing in the world was the denial of sin. And I think one of the heresies of our times is the denial of sin, and indeed the denial of hell, that there is a serious consequence to our ultimate choices. The worst thing in the world isn't the terrible idea of hell, and it is terrible, and our Lord speaks of it more than anyone else in the Bible, but it is the denial of it. If you were the evil one, and you had to plan a strategy to destroy souls, if you were bent on the destruction of souls, A most marvelous strategy would be the denial of sin and the denial of hell and the presumption of false mercy. There's a false mercy around today which says when people are living in objective states of sin, even in adultery, this isn't really sin. Everyone's doing it. It's not kind to count these states and these actions as sin. Have you heard people say things like that? I see this, I hear this as a priest. Indeed, they say it is merciful to invite everyone to communion, no matter what the state of their lives, their souls. Is this mercy? This is not mercy. And it does not help anyone. Good pastoral practice, good care for souls, always follows true doctrine. And these two must remain in inseparable harmony, If we say to someone who is in a state of life that is objectively contrary to Christ's gospel that everything is fine, don't worry, we participate ourselves in that state and we are cementing them, cementing them into the problem. We're even taking away the very ladder of escape. We are refusing to give them the antidote to the poison that harms them. That is not mercy. That is not mercy. And when we say to someone who has committed a mortal sin and is not in a state of grace, oh, please go to communion. We're being merciful. We are actually seriously damaging their souls and our own. Remember the words of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians. He who drinks, eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. And he goes on to say that the abuse of the holy in this context of the Eucharist of Holy Communion has caused many to suffer and to be ill. And I sometimes think that the reason we suffer, we are ill as Christian people, is because we are not respecting the holy in communion. This is not mercy. This is harm. Another of the great heresies of our time is the denial of the concept of the state of grace, or at least the teaching that we can lose the state of grace by mortal sin. 
warning after warning by our Lord and his disciples in the New Testament about falling away, about the danger of falling away, of not abiding in him, is frankly ignored. I always like to hold up the example of the Polish people. I have many Polish people in my community here in Ramsgate, and they have a very strong sense, I don't know if you've noticed it, of the state of the soul, the state of grace. At Mass, many of them don't come to communion because they've not prepared themselves properly. They've not been to confession, and they know that it will not benefit their souls if they've not remedied that state in which they are in. They have a very strong sense of that. Now, it's not enough simply to uphold rules or to keep doctrine, but it's a starting point. And without those firm foundations, everything will go awry. We can't just be happy if people are aware of sin and do not wish to follow it, follow the way of Christ, follow the gospel. We have to love enough to desire people to be free, to be whole. Fulton Sheen again said this, where there is no zeal, there is no love. Do we really want people to be free? Do we really want people to be in the state of grace? We're called in the spirit of the Mother of Mercy to rediscover the spiritual works of mercy, and I hope that this coming year of mercy can be a rediscovery of the works of mercy. We know about the corporal works of mercy, visiting the sick, the imprisoned, feeding the hungry. We're pretty good at those, I think, as a community. We can always improve, but the ones we neglect are the list of the spiritual works of mercy. Do you know this list? To instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to admonish sinners, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive offenses willingly, to comfort the afflicted, to pray for the living and the dead. And I think these ones need a lot of work, particularly the difficult ones, because it's not easy to admonish sinners. It's not easy to give instruction to those who are ignorant. It is not easy to counsel the doubtful. But mercy cries out for this. So many people simply don't know the way of Christ. They're not even culpable for sins because they are oblivious. Someone once said to me, well, Father, isn't it better that people don't know because they won't sin then? Isn't ignorance bliss? I said, no, that's not the truth. Because even if someone isn't aware of sin, all the sins cause a certain damage. They cause a damage to relationships, to oneself. They leave a mark, a scar, even when we're not culpable for them. Freedom is knowledge of the truth and the grace to follow it. It is better to instruct the ignorant, to admonish sinners, to counsel the doubtful. I think the call of the year of mercy will be to take these things seriously. Now, returning to Our Lady's role of intercession, one devotion that's becoming very popular and is promoted by our Holy Father, Pope Francis, in fact, it's his favorite devotion, is the devotion to Our Lady, undoer of knots. Have you come across this devotion? And I've handed some pictures out around the church. There are more of you today than I expected, which is wonderful. So I've not, you've probably only got one between two, and it's a lovely picture. You see, we can't solve all the problems, even our own, but she can. She is zealous to help us untie, as Mother of Mercy, even the most difficult and even the tightest of knots. Now, what are these knots that we're speaking about that Our Lady can untie? The knots are caused by sin, our own or someone else's, or the history of sin that builds up through time. The knots can be anguish, disputes, lack of understanding in marriage or between children, violence, lack of peace and joy, drug addiction, alcoholism, addictions to immorality and vice of various kinds, the knots of confusion, lack of faith. Do this sound familiar? We all live with these knots. 
in our families, and to a certain extent in our own lives. There are many knots, and they weigh down our souls. They prevent us. They prevent us from being the children of God that we're meant to be. Now, this beautiful devotion is based upon a picture of Our Lady that Pope Francis saw in a little shrine in Germany, in Augsburg, when he was younger, a younger priest. And he took it back to Argentina, and it became very, very popular there. This is the painting by Johann Schmidtner about 1700, about 300 years ago. This devotion to Our Lady of the Knots, I believe, is a very ancient one, although in its modern form is only a few hundred years old. It's not a contrived modern notion. It's very ancient. Listen to the words of St. Irenaeus, writing about 170 AD. Think about that. That's only 70 years after John the Apostle died. He was the disciple of Polycarp, who himself was the disciple of John. Irenaeus says this, Eve, by her disobedience, tied the knot of suffering for humanity. Mary, on the contrary, by her obedience, has undone it. Eve ties the knot, Mary undoes it. And it's like that in our lives. We get all knotted up in so many ways by our sins, by our difficulties, by our challenges, by the things around us. All knotted up. And Our Lady sometimes is the only one who can undo that knot for us. Take a look at the picture now, if you've got it in front of you. Take a look at the picture. And look at it, not just with your physical eyes, but look at it with the eyes of the soul, with the eyes of faith. Look behind Our Lady. There is the vision of God, the glory of God in the bright gold. That's where she draws us, by true mercy. <coughs> the Holy Spirit is above. The Holy Spirit who works through her. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. It's through the Holy Spirit that our Lord is conceived by Our Lady. But the Holy Spirit does not depoint, depart at that point. The Holy Spirit is constantly working with Our Lady. She is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. He works powerfully through her. Also in this picture, Our Lady is the woman of the Apocalypse. Behold, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. She's the woman of the Apocalypse, the woman of the Assumption, already in heaven, ahead of us, body and soul. She is there to intercede for us as our mother now in heaven. This is her role as mother of mercy. And the angels are significant too here because they too are sent to guide us and they teach us to adore God. Notice also the serpent under her feet. We often see this in art with Our Lady, don't we, where she crushes the head of the serpent. But notice that in this case, the serpent is in the form of a knot. He is the tire of knots, and he is the one that says, you don't need to undo them. He is the father of false mercy, but it's Our Lady who undoes them. The serpent, of course, the liar, the one who says, it doesn't matter, you will not die. God is a liar, the church is wrong. You've not sinned. These knots are just you, your identity, your freedom. You are God. You're the maker of reality. And she crushes that head. You see, she is a powerful mother, a mother of mercy. Not a weak, sentimental mother, but a powerful mother of mercy. And you notice at the bottom, Tobias being led by the angel. Have you ever read the book of Tobit? Wonderful. All about very knotty situations. And the angel guides Tobias. Interestingly, this particular painting in Augsburg has, was commissioned by a man called Jerome 
Langham mantle. He, was, he commissioned it because of an event in his family history where his grandparents were going to split up. And he, there was a priest involved, Father Rem, who made this powerful intercession to Our Lady, the undoer of knots, and said this in prayer and in prayer to Our Lady. In this religious act, I raise the bonds of matrimony to untie all knots and smoothen them. It's interesting that Our Lady in this devotion is untying the knots connected with relationships to do with marriage. And do not many of us in our lives, in our families, in our associations, know very knotty situations connected with relationships and marriage. Many of our families are knotted up in one way or another. And I think it's very rare that anybody can say in Britain today that they do not know of a knotty situation in their family. But the message here is that we should not look for human solutions, worldly solutions, or the ways of false mercy that I have already outlined, but to pray to Our Lady. She can unravel anything, even the most difficult, the most knotty of all situations. There is a solution to every problem. It's all very simple, really, but that's Our Lady, that's Our Lord. Very simple and yet very powerful. Our Mother of Mercy, the undoer of knots, wants to untie our knots. She cares because she has zeal and because she loves us. Confide in her. Welcome her today into your knotty inner house, your soul. Welcome her. Let us welcome her into our souls. And let her begin to untie the knots. Not denying that there are problems, not covering things up like we do when people come to visit our houses so they don't see the, the messy parts. Let us see everything. Simply confide in her with great confidence and let her act. And she will bring us, without doubt, to her Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is present amongst us. Our Lady of Mercy, pray for us. Our Lady, undoer of knots, pray for us. Our Lady, star of the sea, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Ave Maria. Amen.